What's the worst thing about selling your home? Probably all the times you'll have to scramble for a last-minute showing and somehow clean the dishes, pick up your kids' toys, make all the beds, and get out of the house in an hour. Sounds exhausting. That's not the case when you buy and sell a home with Orchard. They'll help you buy and move into your new place first, and then Orchard will take care of all the showings on your old house. That's right, you're already in your new house. No crazy last-minute scrambling. Take a look and see how Orchard can help you at Orchard.com and get started with a no-cost, no-obligation offer. That's Orchard.com. Hello and welcome to the Tennis Podcast, your favorite top tennis list podcast. I'm your host, Nick Amell. I'm your sidekick host, Brandon. This is the show where every week, me or Brandon bring a top 10 list on whatever the fuck we want, and the other tries to guess items 1 through 10 on that list. Exactly. You brought the list this week. Well, I hope you brought the list this week. I didn't bring anything. You know, one of these days that is going to happen where one of us thinks the other's doing it, and then uh, instead of just rescheduling or recording date, I'm just going to release the episode just like that. It wouldn't be my mistake. See what the people think. I won't make that mistake. No. Today, we're doing a listener idea. A listener emailed me and said, why don't you do this? And I said, that's a fucking hell of an idea, you son of a bitch, I'm in. And so we're doing it. We're looking at the top 10 most critically acclaimed Quentin Tarantino films. Most critically acclaimed. Is this according to like Rotten Tomatoes? Yeah, I had a few options for how to do this and uh, Rotten Tomatoes has its problems, but it is the most widely recognized. So that's what we're going with. We're going with the Rotten Tomatoes, uh, which has a score that represents the percentage of professional critic reviews that are positive for a given film. The film has to have at least five reviews. So this is a zero to 100%. 100% means it was good. 0% means it was dog shit. We're covering the top 10 in that ranking. And these are specifically films that he directed. Because there were some before his 90s movies that he was an actor, I guess. That's what I'm trying to to think. I can write down 10 just off the top of my head. I'm sure you've seen all 10 of these, if not very close. My sources today are Box Office Mojo. I also have some box office numbers for each of these. IMDb, Wikipedia. Rotten Tomatoes, of course, and my fucking amazing computer brain. Brandon, what's your uh, opinion on Quentin Tarantino? The man, the myth, and the movies. I love his movies. His movies are some of my favorite movies. As a person, he's just really eccentric and strange, but he seems like he's a decent enough guy. He like paid for a few movie theaters that were going out of business because of the pandemic. Yeah. Well... I can tell you some facts about him. He likes feet. Yes. In a sexual way. He likes bare feet. I've heard that. Is he open about that? Or is that just what people assume because of his movie shots? He kind of confirms it with his movie shots. Okay. What's your opinion of feet, Brandon, sexually speaking? I mean... How many feet have been inside of you? Four, nine? No feet have been inside of me. Okay. But at least for... Like a straight guy looking at uh, women. Nice feet Mm -hmm. are usually like a good sign that like she's good at grooming. Sure. But yeah, but the feet are the last place my eyes go on any person, man or woman. Oh, well, you got to get quicker. Is it not that way for you? No, I do like a full head to toe ocular pat down. Well, yeah, toe would be last then. Well, yeah, but it's head to toe. Toe's last. Okay. We can move on. Why don't you give me a guess now for which of his movies is the most critically acclaimed, the top 10? Hold on, hold, hold on a second. I was just still trying to think of 10. One, two, three, four. Fuck, I've only got eight so far. I think there's exactly 10 that he's done, that he's directed. Okay, I got it. Okay, so I'm going to guess that number 10 is Death Proof. So Death Proof was combined with... Planet Terror. Yeah, Planet Terror. By Robert Rodriguez. Because they were released as a double feature, yeah. And so combined as Grindhouse, Mm -hmm. they are number eight with an 84% Rotten Tomato score. Which, by the way, I should have mentioned this at the top, his lowest scoring movie is 74%, which a lot of movies would die for that rating. So Mm -hmm. all very critically acclaimed. The number one is 92%, but number eight, Grindhouse is 84%. 
Did you see this? This is one of the few I have not seen from him. I did. I, I saw Grindhouse in the theater with my friends. And yeah, the, it had commercials for fake movies, yeah. like trailers for fake movies before uh, and between the two films, Planet Terror and Death Proof. And I, between the two of them, I liked Death Proof better, but I did enjoy them both. So Grindhouse, it's number eight. It was released in 2007. It has adjusted for, I, on all the box office today, I adjusted all of them to 2021 inflation in the US. So the domestic adjusted inflation for this one is $33 million, which is not a lot. It doesn't seem like a lot. Yeah. By, you know, mainstream movie standards, it's not a ton. It was presented as a double feature combining Robert Rodriguez's Planet Terror, a horror comedy about a group of survivors who battle zombie-like creatures, And Tarantino's Death Proof, a slasher about a murderous stuntman who kills young women with modified vehicles. Grindhouse was a commercial failure. Uh, Well, here you go. It did not make back its budget. Due to underperforming at the domestic box office, Planet Terror and Death Proof were released separately in other countries. As part of its theatrical presentation, Grindhouse features fictitious exploitation trailers directed by Rodriguez, Rob Zombie, Edgar Wright, Eli Roth, and Jason Eisner. But some of those fake trailers ended up being real movies. Yeah, because... Machete got made into a, in a movie. Mm-hmm. And so did Hobo with a Shotgun. <laughs> right. I, yeah, I remember that. I don't know if uh, Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS, has plans to make a movie, but I'd like to see that. Was that, what was it called? Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. Hmm. So it's like a, a, were- a female werewolf of the Nazi Of the party. Nazi persuasion, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love the extreme of that. This extreme. That's what the all of Grindhouse was about. Like the uh, bloody, violent versions of the fake trailers in front of Tropic Thunder, which I, which are the best part of the movie Tropic Thunder. Though set in the modern day, the film um, Death Proof uses various unconventional techniques to make the films look like those that were shown in Grindhouse theaters in the seventies. Throughout both feature-length segments and the fake trailers, the film is intentionally damaged to make it look like many of the exploitation films of the 70s, which were generally shipped around from theater to theater and usually ended up in bad shape. It looked like it was in bad shape. Last note is one of the reviews, the consensus from Rotten Tomatoes says, quote, Grindhouse delivers exhilarating exploitation fare with wit and panache, improving upon its source material with feral intelligence. Feral intelligence. Must have been a she-wolf joke. Has anyone uh, ever mistaken you for being fairly intelligent? Maybe fairly, but not fairly. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I'll have another guess here. Go ahead. Is number 10 Kill Bill 2? No, but why, why did you think that? You just didn't like it? No, I just thought it was the lesser of the two Kill Bills, and I thought they were probably lower on the list, but that was just a guess. You're right on all counts, actually, except that Bill, Kill Bill 2 is number 9 and not number 10. Oh, is Kill Bill 1 number 10 then? No, but when I said you're right on all counts, I meant they're both in the bottom oh, half of the list. Yeah. yeah. So, Kill Bill 2 is number 9 with an 84% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes. I saw Kill Bill 1, but not 2. Uh, Kill Bill 2, Grindhouse, and one other film I have not seen. I've seen all the rest. Okay, so Kill Bill 2, uh, it has an adjusted for inflation domestic gross of 95 million. 95 million compared to Grindhouse's 33 million. It's a 2004 American neo Western martial arts film starring Uma Thurman as The Bride, who continues her campaign of revenge against the deadly Viper Assassination Squad and their leader, Bill, who tried to kill her and her unborn child. What's your uh, take on Kill Bill 2? I really don't remember very much of Kill Bill 2 at all. I think I fell asleep and woke up for the ending, and I just barely remember it. I mean, that's what I'm basing my guess on, is that it wasn't enough to keep me awake. So Tarantino conceived Kill Bill as an homage to grindhouse cinema, including martial arts film, samurai cinema, blaxploitation, and also spaghetti westerns. Roger Ebert gave the film four out of four, writing, put the two parts together, meaning Kill Bill 1 and 2, and Tarantino has made a masterful saga that celebrates the martial arts genre while kidding it, loving it, and transcending it. This is all one film, and now that we see it whole, it's greater than its two parts. And in 2009, Roger Ebert named Kill Bill one of the 20 best films of the decade. 
Would you be open to a third Kill Bill? I think the Kill Bill story is done. And no, I wouldn't. Well, I do and- not want Tarantino to spend any more of his time or energy if he's going to devote it to a movie on Kill Bill. In July 2019, he said that he and Uma Thurman had talked about a possible sequel and added that if any of my movies were going to spring from my other movies, it would be a third Kill Bill. Well, don't do that. Do something else. I'm with you. Okay, you got Kill Bill at nine and Grindhouse at eight. So Kill Bill one, I'm going to guess, is number seven. It's six. Okay. You should be really embarrassed. Kill Bill Volume 1 is six. Came out in 2003, has a Rotten Tomato score of 85%, and it made the most so far that we've discussed at the box office, adjusted to $104 million domestically. You know, what are we going to say about Kill Bill 1 that we didn't already say about Kill Bill 2? I got something to say. My favorite part of Kill Bill 1 was that fucking creep... Buck. My name's Buck and I came to fuck. Mm -hmm. The one who has the the pussy wagon? Yes. Well, okay, that's the one note I have. Tell me about the pussy wagon. Oh, you know what? The pussy wagon's in another note, but I still have a note. Maybe this is related. You tell me. I can't remember. So near the end of filming, Uma Thurman was injured in a crash while filming the scene in which she drives to Bill. According to Uma Thurman, she was uncomfortable driving the car and asked a stunt driver to do it. Tarantino assured her that the car and road were safe, but she lost control of the car and hit a tree, suffering a concussion and damage to her knees. Thurman requested the crash footage, uh, but Miramax would only release it in Thurman's words if she signed a document releasing them of any consequences of Thurman's future pain and suffering. Tarantino was apologetic, but he and Thurman were acrimonious for years afterward. Acrimonious. She's that. She said afterward about the accident that she went from being a creative contributor and performer to being like a broken tool. So the footage of the crash was finally released to police following the accusation of sexual abuse by producer Harvey Weinstein. So I know that's not the pussy wagon. Oh, here's that note. My notes are a little confusing. Sorry. The pussy wagon vehicle. She didn't get hurt in the pussy wagon. The pussy wagon from the movie made a cameo in the music video for Lady Gaga's song Telephone. I knew I had a note about the pussy wagon, but I couldn't remember what it was. There you go. So I threw a lot at you. What are your reactions to all of it, please? Well, the pussy wagon walked away with the best PR out of everybody from Kill Bill. Yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe they're not friends anymore. Well, he had he probably had to tell Uma's feet goodbye. He does love her feet, doesn't he? (laughs) Isn't uh, her feet in the cover of Pulp Fiction because her legs are like bent toward the camera? Well, yeah, that means it's also fairly common like kind of pose but yeah there might have been something to that too yeah well let's move on then so you got both kill bills okay well i'm kind of struggling with with number 10 then could number 10 be reservoir dogs no of course not i wouldn't think so but i'm kind of scraping for number 10s well let's put reservoir dogs on ice for a minute let's focus on number 10 it's a recent one a recent one not the most recent Oh, Django unchained no, no, but very close in themes to that. The Hateful Eight? The Hateful Eight is number 10. Whatever, people don't know shit. I love The Hateful Eight. You know, I, I just watched it like a month ago for the first time in years. Mm-hmm. I had remember not loving, loving it before. I think maybe just because it was long and I was in a movie theater, I don't know. But when I watched it this time, I just loved it. It's like one of my favorites now. Yeah, I like it a lot better than Kill Bill 1 or 2. Same. But the critics don't. Critics are always right, Brandon. Customer is always an asshole. Well, in this case, the assholes voted Hateful Eight at a 74% Rotten Tomatoes score. It also didn't do great at the box office. It did okay, but by the standards of some of his other films, it did not do great. $62 million adjusted gross in the U.S. It's a 2015 American revisionist Western thriller film starring our boy and listener of the show, Samuel L. Jackson. Kurt Russell and others as eight strangers who seek refuge from a blizzard in a stagecoach stop over sometime after the American Civil War. I love this movie because it's almost all in one place and it's all dialogue driven. Well, until the end. Mm -hmm. For his work on the score, uh, I'm missing his first name, uh, Morricone, you know, the ecstasy of gold guy. What's his first name? Ennio Morricone. More yeah, he won his first Academy Award for Best Score from this movie. Yeah. He had never won it before. 
which is bullshit. Uh, the Hateful Eight is Tarantino's final film to have the involvement of the Weinstein Company as the, he ended his relationship with them following the Harvey Weinstein shit in 2017. Now, you might remember this from our Samuel L. Jackson episode, which is episode 99, by the way. But Brandon brought a note that I'll briefly recap here. There was a guitar destroyed in the movie by Kurt Russell's character. It was not actually a prop, but an antique 1870s guitar lent by the Martin Guitar Museum. The guitar was supposed to have been switched with a copy to be destroyed, but that didn't happen. Kurt Russell got lost in the moment, I guess, and destroyed the 1870s antique guitar. It was said that Tarantino was in the corner of the room with a funny curl on his lips because he got something out of it with his performance. As a result, though, the museum no longer lends props to movies. I blame the prop master. I blame the prop master. You can't get in the way of Kurt Russell when he's in the zone. No. If the script calls for Kurt Russell to bash something, you better assume that once his hands touch it, it's as good as bashed. <laughs> yeah. And... I don't know. I mean, who cares? It's just a guitar. <laughs> yeah, the, the guy who... I mean, it wasn't... But yeah, it wasn't played by fucking Willie yeah, Nelson is the or guy something. who made it fucking still alive. Yeah, it's not Willie Nelson's guitar. It's just an old guitar. It's not even Shania Twain's guitar. No, that don't impress me much. Well, you know, you and I both love this movie and disagree with it being number 10, but let me read you one of those negative reviews. Some guy from the BBC said... I'm not alone in thinking that it's Tarantino's worst film, a sluggish, unimaginative dud brimming with venom, but not much cleverness. So, Brandon, you think you're so much smarter than these professional critics? What do you have to say to that? Well, it does have, like, imagination. It is inventive. It does have, like, it keeps me entertained and, like, has kept people talking about it since it was made. So, what have you made, fucking critic? He made you mad. Oh, he didn't make me mad, but yeah. he needs to fucking sling that shit somewhere else. Uh, last note is Tarantino is working on a stage adaptation of The Hateful Eight. May even be done, for all I know, but because of COVID, it hasn't happened yet. I don't know, but it's coming. Hateful Eight coming to a Broadway stage near you. I'd see the fuck out of that. That would actually make a really good Broadway stage, because you don't have to do a bunch of set changes. Is Jackie Brown number two? It's five. Ah, uh, okay. Why? You, you think it sh should be higher? I think it's really good. I didn't realize it would be... I mean, just... This is my... I'm comparing it against my own, like, list, but... No, if that's fine, it can be five. I, I'll live with that. Well, I hope you're okay with that, because it is five. Whether or not you're okay with it, it is five. And it has a Rotten Tomato score of 87%. Adjusted box office is 67 million. Now, Jackie Brown came out in 97. It's a film adaptation of Elmore Leonard's 1992 novel Rum Punch. It is the only feature-length film that Tarantino has adapted from a previous work. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. The film's supporting cast includes, look at fucking who's who, Samuel L. Jackson, Robert Forster, Bridget Fonda, Michael Keaton, Robert De Niro. Quite the A-list there. I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find a much more impressive cast list than that. Of course, I think this was his first movie after Pulp Fiction, so he's riding high here. Roger Ebert gave the film four out of four stars, writing that Tarantino leaves the hardest questions for last, hides his moves, conceals his strategies in plain view, and gives his characters dialogue that is alive, authentic, and spontaneous. Mm -hmm. You agree with that? Yes. What a job, huh? Just reviewing movies. And doing it for fucking 40 years or whatever Getting the hell. fat on popcorn. Can you get fat from popcorn? I guess the butter, right? Sure. It's, but it's you got, you a can't... bunch of carbs, too. Sure. Yeah, you're right. You'd be very fluffy. But they're empty carbs because you don't feel full. If, well, I guess you do. I don't know. I guess ignore me. But, you know, you get the butter on the popcorn, right? When you do get it? Yeah. Usually, if I get too much butter, it's, uh, whew, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to know anybody that goes to the movie theater gets popcorn, but doesn't put the butter on it. The raw dog in it, in regards to, to plain popcorn. Seems very dry. Well, speaking of dry, Jackie Brown has attracted criticism for its heavy utterance of the racial slur, the N-word. The word is used 38 times throughout the film, which is the third most in any Tarantino film mm -hmm. until Django Unchained and The Hateful Eight. 
During an interview, Tarantino is quoted as saying, the minute any word has that much power, as far as I'm concerned, everyone on the planet should scream it. No one deserves that much power. It's an interesting take, I thought. I mean, I, I can't say I agree or disagree, but it's just an interesting take. <laughs> He's kind of an, like an OG troll. He was an internet troll before they were trolls. I mean, he started out in a video store. That's where... So it's where he learned about movies was working at a video store. So he's one of those. That's so like old school American dream type setup, you know? Yeah. He's, so he's got a lot of snide, like neck beard troll type of opinions and comments. I agree that the word has a lot of power, but I also agree that like for the most part in his movies, it makes sense when those characters say it. There are a few times in which it doesn't. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically of in Pulp Fiction, when Quentin Tarantino himself appears as... Uh, oh, yeah. Crap, what is his name? Can't remember his name, but I, I know the scene, yeah. But, you know, that's the house they go to clean up after they accidentally shoot Marvin in the car. Yeah. He asks, is there a sign on my fr the front of my house that says, dead inward storage? And I always thought that, like, that one just seemed like... He scripted himself to say it is the other thing that's weird about it. Yeah, you know? that one always stood out to me as like it didn't need to be there. And I always thought that Jules is the kind of guy that wouldn't let that slide from a dork. Yeah, right. But he does, uh, Jules isn't even phased by it, right? If I recall. No, he doesn't. He doesn't seem to care about it at all. To be fair, Jules did have more pressing shit to deal with at that exact moment. That's true. Well, speaking of Jules, who is played by Samuel L. Jackson... He said of the use of that word in Jackie Brown, he said, did they have another name to call the black people they were talking about at the time? He goes on to say, if you're going to deal with the language of the time, you deal with the language of the time. And that was the language of the time. I grew up in the South. I heard that word all my life. I'm not disturbed by it. Yeah, I mean, we could, like my opinion on it, I think means a lot less than Samuel Jackson, who of grew, course, up, yeah. in, who I mean, grew I, up in yeah. the South and it's probably had that word slung at him a time or two. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said about Samuel Jackson, what he said, if you're going to deal with the language of the time, you deal with the language of the time. Yeah. That said, I'm not an expert. I'm not a historian, whatever. This is probably not the episode for us to test out. No. Yeah. Let's, let's move on then. So uh, give me another guess. Well, I'm going to guess that Django Unchained is, is it number seven? No. Uh, it's number four though. Okay. You know, this is the good thing about this list. You got to love this kind of list because there's only 10 total movies that he's done, I think. So any guess you get is going to be on the list. It's got to be on here. Yeah. Django Unchained has an 87% on Rotten Tomatoes and 193 million adjusted domestic box office, which is his second highest grossing film of all time. It's set in the Old West and Antebellum South. Highly stylized, heavily re revisionist tribute to spaghetti westerns, in particular the 1966 Italian film Django by Sergio Carbucci, whose star Franco Nero has a cameo appearance in Django Unchained. I love so that. That's cool. I saw it at the theater. The 1966 one, you mean, right? Yeah. Okay. The film, Django Unchained, received numerous awards and nominations, as well as five nominations at the Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Uh, Christoph Waltz won several awards for his performance. He is the best part of the movie, in my opinion. Among them, Best Supporting Actor, costume designer Sharon Davis said much of the film's wardrobe was inspired by spaghetti westerns and other works of art. You don't fucking say. For Django's wardrobe, Davis and Tarantino, Davis being the, war the costume designer, watched the television series Bonanza and referred to it frequently. The pair even hired the hat maker who designed the hat worn by the Bonanza character Little Joe, played by Michael Landon, friend of the show. <laughs> he step looking down at us from heaven. I like that, you know, when Quentin Tarantino mo does a movie, he can do whatever the fuck he wants and get whatever he wants. And he says, I want the guy who made the hats on Bonanza. Get me that guy. That is pretty cool. And they got him. So our friend Robert Ebert, Roger Ebert, who we've mentioned a few times, he gave the film four out of four stars. He said the film offers one sensational sequence after another, all sort of set around these two intriguing characters who seem opposites but share pragmatic financial and personal issues. I love the relationship between Django and what's his name? What's Waltz's name in the movie? Uh, Schultz? Yeah, he's a dentist. Which, by the way, 
A dentist in the fucking 1860s? He was a fucking murderer himself. Yeah, what did they do? I mean, I guess back then you didn't go for checkups, right? You only went when something was fucking terribly wrong. Yeah, it was just somebody who was really good at pulling out teeth. Yeah. That's the thing I thought about too, like <laughs> way off topic here. But a few times you've mentioned on the show that you think <laughs> we're all going to be living out of wagons with donkeys on dust-covered roads before, <laughs> before too long mm-hmm. because society will collapse. When that happens, what are we going to do about our toothaches? Your teeth are just going to come out. You have to eat really soft food. When you get a toothache, that's something that you fucking feel every second of the day. It sucks. Luckily, I haven't had one in a long time, but yeah. I remember... Uh, it's like an earache. Remember um, the movie Castaway? He has to use yes. an ice skate and a rock to knock his tooth out And he out was willing to do that to get some relief. Yeah. Holy hell, yeah. Yeah. Well, The Independent said Django Unchained was part of the, quote, new sadism in cinema and added, there is something disconcerting about sitting in a crowded cinema as an audience guffaws or... Gaffaws? Gaffaws. At the latest garroting or falls about in hysterics as someone is beheaded or has a limb lopped off. Well, it is funny because we know it's fucking fake, you idiots. And Brandon, <laughs> this is a professional critic. Yeah, and it was ridiculously fake at times in Django. Remember towards the end when he shoots Calvin Candy's sister? Yeah. Yes. He shoots her with like, I mean, I think it's just a regular pistol. And she goes flying, goes flying, rocketing backward at an angle that doesn't even physically make sense. Yeah, it's funny when he shoots guys like their arms will like explode off and blood will shoot out. It's it's absurd. (laughs) It's meant it's meant to be entertaining. It's not it doesn't have to. When are you going to admit that you're a bloodthirsty sadist savage? Yeah. Just go ahead and say it. I drink blood. You and Tom Hanks. One of the parts that is hard to watch for me, despite everything you said, the violence that you see during the Mandingo fighting. That's pretty rough. <laughs> that, is, that is rough, and it seems to go on forever. I just looked away last time I watched it. I couldn't deal with it. So about that, about the Mandingo fighting, which, by the way, if you haven't seen the movie, it's when two slaves are forced to fight to the death. Tarantino said, I was always aware those things existed, but there is actually... That was the end of the quote. There is no definitive historical evidence that slave owners ever staged gladiator-like fights to the death between male slaves like the fights depicted in the movie. Historians noted there are only undocumented rumors of such fights, but to that I say, of course that fucking happened. Uh, yeah. You don't think some rich fucking white asshole said, let's make them fight till one dies. He- yeehaw! If you can think... It'll be a hell of a time. If you can think of something horrible to do, somebody has done it before. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, listen to us talk. Yeah, I'm sure somebody uh, set up a fight like that before. And we don't condone it here on the Tennis Podcast. Mm-mm. You could have a hug fight. A hug fight. Well, now, what would that look like? Same thing as a Mandingo fight, but... But what? Gentler. Gentler, and it doesn't end with your eyes getting gouged out. Well, how do you win a hug fight? The other person's got to die. <laughs> <laughs> So it's just worse then, because it will take 20 times as long, but someone's still going to die in the end. Maybe so. Okay, so that's the hug fight for anyone looking for uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur... You need to move... Yeah, God, fucking damn it. <laughs> What's the worst thing about selling your home? Probably all the times you'll have to scramble for a last-minute showing and somehow clean the dishes, pick up your kids' toys, make all the beds, and get out of the house in an hour. Sounds exhausting. That's not the case when you buy and sell a home with Orchard. They'll help you buy and move into your new place first, and then Orchard will take care of all the showings on your old house. That's right, you're already in your new house. No crazy last-minute scrambling. Take a look and see how Orchard can help you at Orchard.com and get started with a no-cost, no-obligation offer. That's Orchard.com. General managers ask questions to find the right players, like, do they have ice in their veins? When you're hiring... You can use Indeed assessments to make sure you find the right candidates with the skills you need. Don't just hope your perfect candidate will find you. Indeed's hiring tools help you cut through the noise to hire faster and smarter. In fact, Indeed Instant Match provides a list of quality candidates whose resumes are on Indeed the moment you post a sponsored job. And with Indeed assessments, choose from 135 skills tests to help make sure you're finding applications from people with skills you need. 
Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, you need one, two, three. One, two, three, and seven. seven. I'm going to guess... Glorious Bastards. Where is that on the list? Is that number seven? You got a hard on for guessing number seven, and you've yet to exercise that demon in your hard on because it's number three is Inglorious Bastards. Huh. Inglorious Bastards. I enjoyed it when I saw it, but I have not seen it in years. So it's, I'm due for a rewatch. I've seen it a few times. How's it hold up? It holds up great. Cool. Well, critics agree because they gave it 89% on Rotten Tomatoes and it has adjusted box office of $153 million. The film tells an alternate history story of two plots to assassinate Nazi Germany's leadership, one planned by a young French-Jewish cinema proprietor and the other by the British, but ultimately conducted solely by a team of Jewish-American soldiers. So this movie came out in 2009, but Tarantino actually wrote the script 11 years earlier in 1998 but he struggled with the ending and chose instead to focus on his two-part Kill Bill film. After directing Death Proof in 2007, though, he returned to work on Inglorious Bastards, and it finally came out in 2009. He viewed the script as his masterpiece. He felt it had become the best thing he ever wrote. The film received widespread acclaim with praise for his screenplay, direction, and performances. It also won multiple awards, including eight Academy Award nominations. So I have some trivia now for you mm-hmm. of some of the original cast. Have you heard any of these who was supposed to play these people? Um, I've heard of one. The only one I know of is that originally, instead of Eli Roth, who played the bear Jew. Yeah. <laughs> instead of Eli Roth playing the bear Jew, it was supposed to be Adam Sandler. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? The bear Jew. I actually think I'd prefer that. Adam Sandler would have brought something to it. Yeah, same. Eli Roth is not horrible, but he's not Adam Sandler. He doesn't jump off the page like Adam Sandler would. And I don't know. I think Adam Sandler could have had some fun with that. And he showed us in Uncut Gems, one of the best movies of like the last five years, that he can act. He's got it. He's got it. And for more on Adam Sandler, listen to our episode. In fact, we did the same thing, the critically acclaimed Adam Sandler movies. Anyway, so yes, Adam Sandler was supposed to have Eli Roth's role. Here's another one. Uh, Hans Landa, or Landa, who was played by Hans Landa. Uh, Christoph Waltz. Yeah. Yeah. That was originally supposed to be Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio. Mm-hmm. But Tarantino changed his mind because he wanted to have a native German-speaking actor. And Tarantino, when he gave the role to Christoph Waltz, said, that gave me my movie, as he feared that the part was unplayable, as he had wrote it. Basically, Christoph Waltz showed him that he could do it. Yeah, it's hard, uh, to, it's hard to imagine anybody else playing that character. And correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm just ignorant, but I think that was Christoph Waltz's like, big break, at least in the U.S., right? That's the first thing I remember seeing him in, for yeah, sure. Same. When the movie was shown at the Keynes Film Festival, it received an 11-minute standing ovation from critics. However, that wasn't good enough for Le Monde a leading French newspaper who dismissed the standing ovation saying, Tarantino gets lost in a fictional World War II. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Brandon, by liking this film, you basically acknowledge that you don't take World War II seriously. Is that right or not? I would say that the part of the reason why I like this movie is because I do take World War II pretty seriously. I'm very interested in it. I've seen and read a lot on it. And... That's just the point, is that we've all, most of us have seen many World War II movies, and many of them done in a very similar way. So this was one that showed us something, showed us a perspective that maybe we hadn't seen before, and yeah, the ending is some fantastical stuff, but... Well, let me tell you about the ending real quick. Okay. When I saw this movie, other than Kill Bill, this might have been the first Tarantino film I saw. I wasn't like up to speed on all of his tropes. And I remember thinking, I said it out loud to the person I watched the movie with, something to the effect of, you know, the problem with watching these movies based on history is you know how it's going to end. You know that they're not going to kill Hitler. Au contraire, you idiot. Yeah. 
Uh, spoiler alert, I guess. But you go into a movie like this and you just forget sometimes because you get caught up in the story that the fucking people making the movie can do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. They don't have to abide by history. It doesn't have to be historically accurate. That's, yeah, like you said, that's the fun. So it was a great surprise at the end. Mostly what I'm looking for out of a movie is show me something I haven't seen before. Surprise me. Right. And you get a lot of that on Pornhub as well. The film was met by criticism from the Jewish press. One Jewish journalist said the film was lacking moral depth. He argues that the power of film lies in its ability to impart knowledge and subtle understanding, but Inglorious Bastards serves more as an alternative reality, a magical world where we needn't worry about the complexities of morality, where violence solves everything, and where the Third Reich is always just a film reel and a lit match away from cartoonish defeat. Well, what's wrong with that? Is that part of the reason why we go to the movies? Yeah, I mean, I can see two sides of it because on one hand, you know, if you're constantly hammering into a generation, not that not that Inglorious Bastards is doing that, but for the sake of example, if you're constantly hammering in the point to a young generation that this is funny, this is a joke, we don't take Hitler or the Nazis seriously, then I don't know, I could see them growing up not realizing the magnitude of that. However, to counterpoint what I just said, I don't think that's possible because of fucking history class. And we're just constantly reminded of the monstrosities of World War II. Yeah, it's a movie for grownups. Yeah, well put. Let's tie a bell on that and give me your three final guesses. Okay. I now guess that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is number seven. You finally itched that number seven scratch or scratch the itch. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is number seven. With an 85% score, it's the uh, third highest grossing film he's done with 180 million adjusted domestic box office. See, I liked it better than uh, Kill Bill also. I did too. I did too. Did you like it better than Jackie Brown? Mm, I don't know. Great. So set in 1969, Los Angeles, the film follows a fading character actor and his stunt double as they navigate the rapidly changing film industry with the looming threat of the Tate murders hanging overhead. Those are the Manson family murders. It features multiple storylines in a modern fairy tale tribute to the final moments of Hollywood's golden age. You know, that's a just, I don't know, just coming up with this screenplay from scratch, just a very interesting tie-in of all that stuff. There's something about the Manson murders and who they happened to and where they happened at and when they happened yeah. as being a part of the end of a certain era of maybe innocence at the very least the end of a certain era and the marking of something new a lot of the movie is about the transition between the old and the new yeah i don't know i like it a lot i own it i think the sound is really good in it the sound design in it. it's the first time i've noticed in one of his movies how like strong the sound design was even outside of the music yeah let me tell you some more about it. It received 10 nominations for, at the Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Did you know that Tarantino wrote a novel for this movie in his debut as an author? It just came out recently. Yeah, June 29th of 2021. I have not read it yet, but I will. A TV series titled Bounty Law, based on a TV program depicted in the film, is currently being developed by Tarantino. Is that the one that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character is in? I think so. Well, anyway, it's becoming a real show made by Tarantino. <laughs> Sweet. Did you know Bruce Dern was cast as George Spawn at the Spawn Ranch, with the, where the Manson family were staying? Uh, but originally, that role was uh, Burt Reynolds. But Burt died Hell in yeah. September 2018 before filming any of his scenes. And I know that as much as you liked this movie, you would have liked it even more if yeah. it had old Burt. He's the, uh, the Ben Affleck of the 70s. Yeah. Now he's the Ben Affleck of, of heaven. At least until Ben Affleck gets there. Mm -hmm. But he's going to have to peel his hand away from uh, J-Lo's bum bum first to do that. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Tarantino had to, as part of this movie, he had to turn Los Angeles of 2018 into Los Angeles of 1969 without computer-generated imagery. At least that was his goal. Despite his intent, the production wound up using more than 75 digital visual effects, mainly to cover up modern billboards. Other than that, though, it was mostly done without CGI. Yeah, it shows. It looks awesome. It looks like it in a time machine. To improve the use of practical effects, Leonardo DiCaprio was allowed to light stunt coordinators on fire 
while shooting scenes with a flamethrower. Cool. What a badass day at the fucking office. Hey, Leo, come over here for a minute. Yeah, so you read your lines. Good. You know what to do today. By the way, here's a flamethrower. Go fucking light innocent people on fire, please. Thank you. Light a man on fire today, please. I don't know if I could do it. Could you do that? If someone handed you a flamethrower and said, light that man on fire. And they're paying me Leonardo DiCaprio money? (laughs) Well, I guess that's the kicker, huh? Well, I mean, they probably didn't even have to pay me. Just make me, you know, give me a waiver. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure there were waivers involved. Here's a note of trivia. So Rick Dalton, which is Leo's character in the movie, he flubs his line in a scene. The scene in which Rick Dalton flubs his lines in Lancer was not in the screenplay, but rather an idea by DiCaprio that he had on set. Afterwards, Tarantino came up with the idea for Dalton's freakout scene in his trailer, taking inspiration from Robert De Niro's performance in Taxi Driver. Tarantino stated, it's got to be like Travis Bickle when he's in his apartment by himself. DiCaprio improvised the entire scene. Well, he really freaked the fuck out on himself. He said some very unkind things to himself. Yeah, that's where he's throwing shit around in the trailer, right? Yeah. So, uh, a note that the 1966 Cadillac DeVille that Rick Dalton drives in the movie is the exact car driven by Mr. Blonde in Reservoir Dogs. Oh. I did not know that. Which is a perfect segue into my into guess Reservoir Dogs. for number two, Reservoir Dogs. I like how you knew number one from the start, without question. Mm-hmm. You're right. But Reservoir Dogs is number two, even though you stupidly guessed it at number 10 earlier. <laughs> yeah. Reservoir Dogs has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. It came out in 92. This was Tarantino's feature-length debut. It only grossed, adjusted for inflation, less than $5 million at the box office. Yeah. So keep in mind, Pulp Fiction, which we're going to talk about in a minute, grossed almost $200 million, which came out two years after Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs, less than $5 million, So It's not about dogs. Is that right? I went in expecting a movie about dogs. I don't think Is they're... this not the one where the dog plays basketball with the kid? Mm-mm, there's not one fucking dog in this whole movie. The film is about diamond thieves whose planned heist of a jewelry store goes terribly wrong. The film depicts the events before and after, but not during, the heist. It incorporates many motifs that have become Tarantino's hallmarks, which include violent crime, pop culture references, profanity, and nonlinear storytelling. I like how profanity is lumped right next to nonlinear storytelling as a film device for for our friend Tarantino. Mm Mm-hmm. The film is regarded as a classic of independent film and was named the greatest independent film of all time by Empire. Roger Ebert was less enthusiastic. So remember, Roger Ebert gave, I think, Django and Jackie Brown, maybe others too. He gave those four out of four, but for Reservoir Dogs, he gave it two out of four. He said that the film feels like it's going to be terrific, but his script does not have much curiosity about the characters. I liked what I saw, but I wanted more. I'm just thinking about being named Mr. Brown. Steve Buscemi goes, Mr. Pink sounds like Mr. Pussy. How about if I'm Mr. Purple? Well, this is timely. We just talked about colors, remember? On our bonus Mm -hmm. episode coming out soon. I think we agreed you are brown, right? You, brown? Uh, It's too close to Mr. Shit. (laughs) Well, I know that you played the video game for Reservoir Dogs that came out in 2006. Oh, God, no. This sounds terrible. The game does not feature the likeness of any of the actors. With the exception of Michael Madsen. It's Madsen. just dogs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the dogs are on the poker table that go on a heist. Yeah. The game was received unfavorably with GameSpot calling it an out-and-out failure. But that didn't stop a sequel, Reservoir Dogs Bloody Days, in 2017. I mean, he's right. You think it's better or worse than the Dumb and Dumber video game? I don't remember the Dumb and... Was there a Dumb and Dumber video game? Or maybe it's The Mask. One of those Jim Carrey movies had a video game. It had to be The Mask, and I'm sure it was even worse than the movie. By the way, we covered Jim Carrey, too, on a past episode. Okay. All right. Number one. You just got number one. What is it? Do you want to guess? It's got to be Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. How'd you know? 92%. Almost unheard of. That high on Rotten Tomatoes. This was the movie that made Quentin Tarantino. It's his highest grossing film ever with $198 million in the U.S. alone adjusted for inflation. It tells the story of sev- tells several stories, actually, of criminal Los Angeles. The title refers to the pulp magazines and hard-boiled crime novels popular during the mid-1900s. 
known for their graphic violence and punchy dialogue. Kind of like us. Uh Uh-huh. We have some punchy dialogue. The movie is widely regarded as his masterpiece with particular praise for its screenwriting. It is often considered a cultural watershed influencing films and other media that adopted elements of its style. Yeah, there were a lot of rip-offs. The thing I like most, first of all, we talked about this movie at length in our Samuel L. Jackson episode, episode 99. And in that episode, we talked a lot about what I'm about to say again, which is that Samuel Jackson is my favorite part of the movie. And in fact, my favorite scenes are just the scenes where he's fucking talking. Mm-hmm. The first scene with the burger, the scene where he's talking about eating a bitch out to uh, John Travolta's character. The end, like every time he's on screen, it's Sticking just... your tongue into the holiest of holies. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Fuck, I love his character in that movie. It's like in my top 10 personal favorite characters of anything. So, yeah. And the fucking uh, Congress agrees because in 2013, Pulp Fiction was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. One of the few bad reviews of this film when it first came out came from the Los Angeles Times, who said... The writer-director appears to be straining for his effects. Some sequences, especially one involving bondage, bondage, harnesses, and homosexual rape, had the uncomfortable feeling of creative desperation, of someone who's afraid of losing his reputation, scrambling for any way to offend sensibilities. I thought he was just trying to think of, like, what's the most, like, fucked up thing these hillbillies could do with... (laughs) These hillbillies. That's what um, Marcellus Wallace calls them. Yeah. He calls them these... Fucking, <laughs> I can't do his voice. Fucking about to spend the rest of your life in agonizing pain, hillbilly motherfucker. You know, speaking of, I think that's John Travolta's last good movie, right? That's a good question. Let me tell you. I'm going to look at his IMDb and tell you if there's anything he's made after Pulp Fiction that I think is good. Well, the movie where he's a dog with Tim Allen, right? Or something like that. You're talking about fucking wild hogs. I don't know. Is that it? I saw it, man. Those <laughs> hogs are wild. I guess he's not a dog in that. But. Let me see here. So, Pulp Fiction 1994. Okay, Get Shorty was good. Oh, okay. Was that after? Yeah. I think Primary Colors was technically okay. He's in the thin red line, but so is everyone else. And that shouldn't count because no one could tell what fucking movie they were in. Okay. He played Turl in Battlefield Earth 2000. It's one of the, like, the most famously bad movies of all time. I'm going to say he's had a lot more misses than hits since Pulp Fiction. Hairspray. I'm looking and I don't see anything on here that I remember being any good. He was in American Crime Story, the OJ season, but he was, again, the worst part of, the, <laughs> the yeah. worst part of that show. He's not special. So anyway... Well, speaking of the worst part of the show, how about a non-related transition, which is Bob Dole, presidential candidate in the 90s against Bill Clinton. He attacked the American entertainment industry for peddling nightmares of depravity. And he accused Pulp Fiction, which he had not seen, of promoting the romance of heroin. Uh, It doesn't promote the romance of heroin. Yeah, but what do you know? You never ran for president. I love it when she's like, all right. When they're going to give her the adrenaline to wake her up after she overdoses on the heroin. Like, all right, you got to stab her. You got to inject it directly into her heart. She's got a breast prone right here, all right? And you're going to have to get through that. It's going to have to come down hard like this. And he goes, well, I got to stab her three times? (laughs) (laughs) Because he shows him coming down three times. I don't know why it always makes me laugh. I have to stab her three times. (laughs) Uh, so we know that Brandon supports heroin abuse because he's like the movie, it's funny. according to Bob Dole. Yeah, it's funny. All right. Before I go back through the top 10, let me read you some answers from my Twitter followers. I asked them, what's the best film made by Quentin Tarantino and why? I asked this on Twitter at the Nick Mel. So some responses here. Mr. Positivity Wolfie T said Reservoir Dogs because of the script, cast, soundtrack, but specifically Nice Guy Eddie. Mm-hmm. Grimm said, once upon a time, brah, because it's got a companion novel that just came out. Simon says, Inglorious Bastards, the stellar cast and convincing revisionist history, equal parts dark humor and intense drama. That's well said, I thought. 
Last one I'll read is from That Show About Nothing. They say, Hateful Eight, the story carried that film more than any of his others, which I agree with that. Sure. All right. Appreciate your uh, great feedback there, Brandon. Let's go back through the top 10 most critically acclaimed Tarantino films. Number 10 was The Hateful Eight, 74%. Number 9 was Kill Bill Volume 2. I'd put that at the bottom of my list, personally. Mm -hmm. Number 8 is Grindhouse. 7, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. 6, Kill Bill Volume 1. 5, Jackie Brown. 4, Django Unchained. 3, Inglorious Bastards. 2, Reservoir Dogs. And 1, Pulp Fiction. Brandon, what's your personal top three? Personal top three. Number one, Pulp Fiction. Number two, Inglorious Bastards. And number three, Jackie Brown. Okay. I'm going to go number one, Pulp Fiction. Number two, uh, you know, I'm going to go Hateful Eight. And number three, uh, I want to say Django, but it's so similar to Hateful Eight. I'll do Once Upon a Time in Hollywood at three. And Glorious Bastards might be up there, except I just haven't seen it in so long, I don't remember. But I'm going to rewatch it now. I think all that shit's on Netflix. Yeah. Well, speaking of all that shit, here's some shit from people that reviewed us on Apple Podcasts. First, from Sick of Everything. They, they must be talking about you there. They say, here's a hot take. This is a pretty decent podcast. Easily number three of my top ten favorites. I'm glad and proud to be one of your many and among your many celebrity listeners. Brandon has the best radio personality. Hell yeah, he does. This is just like last week where you created a burner account to go leave a review. I've been creating them all over the place. You know, radio personality, that phrase, mm -hmm. that's going to have no meaning to a generation from now. Mm -mm. Roll down your windows and turn up the radio. When's the last time you turned on a radio? Well, besides like the radio in my car. I don't know. Have you even done that? Yeah, it, sometimes it comes on when the Bluetooth, before the Bluetooth connects. Okay, well that doesn't count. I mean like intentionally turned it on and listened to it instead of... No. I'm going to say like eight years for me, maybe or more, I don't know. Probably last time I just bumped into a stereo and a radio turned on. Yeah. Okay, well thank you for that review. The next yeah, one comes you. from Oda uh, on Apple Podcasts. So I'm four episodes in and I've learned something new with everyone. Fun podcast think that stuff you should know podcast but with likable hosts there's a uh, passive burn against stuff you should know i guess but i'll take it yeah fuck those guys yeah they're listening right now fuck you yeah fucking dumb shit you ought to not know unsubscribe thank you for the reviews if you want me to read your review go write a review i'll read it on a future episode but make it nice didn't Tarantino said he's done at, I think he said 12 films, right? Or was it Ma, 10? He said 10. He's supposed to be done, but I don't know. I don't think he'll be done. There's no chance in hell he's done. I hope not. He's got dollar signs in his eyes. Yeah. And, and his, toes in his mouth. Toes in his mouth. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had a toe in my mouth, actually. That's, in any circumstance. In yeah. any context. Yeah. But that's okay if, you, if you're into that. Just saying. All right. We'll be back next week with Brandon's list. In the meantime, encourage you to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, at Tennis Pod. And let's see, what else do I want to plug? That's it. That's enough. That's it. Enough plugging. Enough plugging. I'm going to go to fucking sleep. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Thanks. What's the worst thing about selling your home? Probably all the times you'll have to scramble for a last-minute showing and somehow clean the dishes, pick up your kids' toys, make all the beds, and get out of the house in an hour. Sounds exhausting. That's not the case when you buy and sell a home with Orchard. They'll help you buy and move into your new place first, and then Orchard will take care of all the showings on your old house. That's right. You're already in your new house. No crazy last-minute scrambling. Take a look and see how Orchard can help you at Orchard.com and get started with a no-cost, no-obligation offer. That's Orchard.com.